sleek and they go fast and they make lots of noise and everybody is wowed by them. They're deceptively beautiful. It's like Venus flytraps. Aircraft launch from the sea, from carriers. Air-to-air -air missiles, air-to-ground missiles, GPS-guided bombs. One of those frontline Hornets has everything you could need to, to really just go out there and, and wreak havoc. These aircraft have left their mark on America's history in ways that few of us know. They had no right to win, but they did. And in doing so, they changed the course of a war. I lost 22% of the guys in my squadron. 22%, you never forget that. This film follows young pilots today as they learn their craft and tells the sweeping history that they are heirs to. I watched every World War movie I could get my hands on as a little kid. The history was one of the things that really drew me to this life. These were people who were willing to literally bet their lives to go ahead and bring this technology and this new kind of warfare to the forefront. Back in the early 20th century, this is somewhat psychotic. You are a part of a lineage of people that have been witness to the biggest events of the 20th and now 21st century. You feel that every day you're a part of something bigger. But embedded in this lineage is also controversy. Again and again over its hundred years, this craft has been called into question as impractical, extravagant, obsolete. Now, today, a new round of doubts and reason to wonder if this generation of aviators just might be America's last. This is the story of a weapon that changed the face of war. We did our cross country to, uh, to Vegas. She's a good instructor. I started racing dirt bikes, actually. I kind of want to be a professional dirt bike racer and then quit the racing, went to college, and decided to come in the Marine Corps. And best decision ever made. Yeah. Should be pretty cool. Cool. Y'all following him out? Good luck. Thank you. My mom used to take us uh, to an airport nearby where we grew up, and you could sit out close to the flight line and see people taking off and landing and stuff, and saw planes flying over. Uh, like this guy. It kind of captivates a young mind, I think, and it definitely grabs me early on. I tell a student, you know, hey, what am I gonna teach you how to do here? I want you to learn how to Taxi, take off, go out and do something, and you're gonna come back and land. And you're gonna do that on land, and you're gonna do that on a ship. Every little thing will affect your psyche before you're going out to the boat. You're going over the entire flight 500 times in your head long before you even get there. You can imagine the, the instruments and how they're changing. In your head, you can imagine the airplane accelerating faster. We're going to fly out there. First time you see the carrier that you're going to, it'll be about 15 miles out, and you realize you're 
Gonna be landing on there, stopping on what looks to be about a little drop of oil in the sea. I think universally, the first time you roll up behind the boat, uh, oh crap, is what comes to people's minds. Uh, everybody says it looks like a postage stamp. Uh, the first time you go overhead, uh, you look down and think, well, there's no way. They, they made a bad mistake. Part of the, the mental preparation is, is trying to think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see it. It's gonna look different than what I imagined. Uh, it's gonna feel different than the simulator. I'm gonna freak out and I'm gonna keep flying. In the early 20th century, Americans flocked to air meets to witness with their own eyes a man take to the sky. In an age of innovation, nothing seemed more wondrous than the airplane. These air meets would draw people from all walks of life. It was real popular because here they have these aircraft flying, buzzing around. Well, oftentimes there were accidents which were almost as appealing as the uh, flying itself. The Army and Navy too were intrigued and sent their representatives to the very first air meets. The Army instantly saw the potential of flight and began purchasing airplanes. The Navy, though, was at a loss. The idea of using a flying machine on the open sea was beyond almost everyone's imagination. Everyone except a middle-aged naval officer convinced that planes and ships working together could become a powerful new weapon. Captain Washington Irving Chambers is sort of an unlikely champion of aviation. He's a product of the 19th century, um, traditional naval warfare. Um, he graduated from the Naval Academy not too far removed from the Civil War. But Chambers, really expressed an interest in aviation. He wanted to look into it and study it. That's why he traveled to some of the air meets that were happening. He would go there to see what the latest technology in aviation was. In the fall of 1910, Chambers attended an air show in Belmont Park, New York, in search of a pilot willing to try a grand experiment, launching an aircraft from a ship. Among the daredevils and showmen at the meet, one man clearly stood out, Eugene Ely. Most people think early aviation. They think of aviators in these, you know, leather jackets and flowing scarves and everything. And Ely, he just doesn't look the part of the dashing aviator. If you look at the pictures of him performing these feats, he was wearing a standard business suit. He had a bicycle inner tube wrapped around him for flotation. He wore a primitive football helmet. He's from Iowa as far away from the ocean as you can possibly imagine, and someone who really didn't really care for the water and didn't really like swimming. But when Chambers proposed the idea, Ely, the man who didn't like water, couldn't resist. In addition to being a pretty good pilot, Ely also had a surprising eye as an engineer. He gets the idea that he can build a wooden flight deck on a warship, like a cruiser or a battleship, and actually get it going fast enough that if he flies his airplane off the end of it, he can actually get it into the air and safely maneuver it. Well, back in the early 20th century, this is somewhat psychotic. Soon after their meeting, Chambers outfitted the cruiser, the USS Birmingham, with a makeshift wooden deck Built to Ely's specifications, the platform was only 83 feet long and 24 feet wide. On the morning of November 14, 1910, rain squalls filled the sky. Ely waited nervously. Finally, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the weather cleared. 
So Ely climbed aboard and revved up the engine as much as it would go. And as he went over the edge of the deck and out over the water, he actually descended a little bit quicker than he thought. He thought he might crash, and the wheels actually grazed the water as he took off from Birmingham. But um, picked up enough flying speed that the wind went beneath the wings, developed some lift, and he was able to take off and fly to shore. Chambers was pleased, but he knew the hardest part was yet to come, landing a speeding airplane on a rolling ship. Again, Chambers relied on Ely's practical know-how. Ely was facing the prospect of flying into the back of the smokestacks of the ship, so he had to come up with some way of stopping the airplane. So what they did is they had sandbags connected by ropes, and these ropes were strung across the wooden deck at a series of intervals. And there were a series of hooks beneath the aircraft, and as these hooks snagged on those ropes, the weight of the sandbags there would bring the plane to a stop as it hit the deck. The weather on January 18, 1911, was cold. Ely flew from an air meet to the USS Pennsylvania, 10 miles offshore. Eugene Ely made his approach to Cruiser Pennsylvania and successfully got into what is now referred to as the proper glide slope. Hit the deck and the ropes caught the hooks on the bottom of his aircraft and eventually brought the plane to a stop. And it was just a, a, an amazing event. No one had ever seen anything like this before. I mean, you have to think at that time, you're only about seven years removed, eight years removed from the Wright brothers' flights. And here you have sailors seeing an aircraft land aboard their ship. It was something that was you know, really, one, observing it must have been an experience to remember. And the amazing thing is, the metaphors laid out by Ely of the flight deck, of the arresting gear, of the tail hook, are things that we still use 100 years later. The man was a visionary. But Eugene Ely would not live to see the magnitude of what he'd achieved. Within months, he was killed in a plane crash during an air meet. My father was a A6 intruder guy. So as a young one, I got taken to lots and lots of air shows. I'd climb up on my dad's shoulders. Any kid is gonna look up and think it's grand and amazing and they wanna do it. And remember what I told you about the Roland is that when you, when you see that, that uh, line down there. The thought of landing on the carrier is still a very big idea and not ominous, but it's still a heavy thought, landing on a giant chunk of metal in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, yeah second to last flight for uh, head off to the boat on Monday, so more chances to perfect it or go <laughs> or or bracket the, the mistakes when you're preparing to go to the carrier all the students will grow a mustache it's kind of maybe a little bit of a badge of courage around the squadron that you're far enough in the program that they're going to let you go to the boat some of the fine young gentlemen going out to the boat are not quite as uh gifted in the mustache growing department i guess um some of them look exceptionally creepy. I'm not a mustache guy, but then it doesn't help that my mustache is blonde, so uh, it's not coming in too great, but. 
unless you are a very special girl, you are not going to grow a mustache. But I have every intent of either finding like some like stick on mustache or I'm just going to draw it on every day because, you know, you got to you got to run with the guys. Oh, have you seen the one with the Russian guy? I mean, when I'm at work, I'm one of the dudes. <laughs> when I get home, it's hair down, skirts, dresses. I like being a girl and I've found myself to end up being more feminine now than I used to be because it's almost like recharging the estrogen levels when I get home. It's definitely a competition. Everybody wants to be the best. You know, it doesn't matter if there are Army guys here or Air Force guys here. It's the same thing. Everybody just wants to be the best. With that being said, I mean, Navy guys are my good friends too. There's always a, a little bit of a rivalry between the Navy and the Marines. Jordan and I are pretty good friends. We've gone through all of flight school in Kingsville together. We classed up back 14 months ago and pretty much been flying together. Yeah, me, me and Rob, we started ground school day one in this building together and went through everything pretty much together. That looks good. Uh, probably a little Anytime I was having issues, I would go talk to Rob and Rob would get me straightened out, so. And, uh, we can keep working at Joker, but at Bingo, no kidding, it's time to knock it off and, and point toward home. We're creating a tactical jet naval aviator. Certainly most of the aviators coming through our program are likely to see combat, and yes, they'll be ready. For more than a decade after Eugene Ely's pioneering flights, U.S. naval aviation stood still. Most people would think that, hey, this is a triumphant event. This is a, a major demonstration. The Navy is going to fall over itself to buy aircraft. Well, that wasn't the case. Airplanes were still made of wood and fabric and could barely hold the weight of a man, much less a heavy bomb. But from the moment he witnessed Ely's plane land on a ship, Captain Washington Chambers could imagine the future. Chambers could look down the pipeline and see that there were tantalizing new technologies beginning to appear on the horizon. New materials like aluminum, new structures like monocoques, new fuels like high octane gasoline. Planes were going to get faster, they were going to go farther, they could lift more. They were also going to be more deadly and more maneuverable. By the end of World War I, the airplane had become a part of modern warfare. The British were the leaders, but the Americans were anxious to catch up. So were the Japanese, who built the world's first aircraft carrier from the ground up. The Navy embraced seaplanes for reconnaissance. But the effort involved in lowering and retrieving the planes made them useless for much else. For Chambers, it was clear the Navy was falling behind. He continued to press. You have Chambers going and doing this incredible marketing job to a very conservative general board of the U.S. Navy trying to sell a very new, very expensive technology, which, oh, by the way, required the building of some of the largest and most powerful warships in the world to prove that it was even viable. For the Navy brass, carrier aviation was a distant fantasy. Nothing could replace the king of their fleet, the battleship. Up to this point, the war plans of every nation in the world still envisioned big gun battleships 
eight, 10, 12 at a time, lobbing one-ton shells at each other until one side or the other gave up, and that would determine the fate of nations. The final push towards carrier aviation came unexpectedly, not from inside the Navy, but from an inter-service rivalry fueled by a brash Army general named Billy Mitchell. Mitchell had been in charge of all America's airplanes in World War I, an experience that forever changed his vision of war. If you look at World War I, it was just a horrific experience. You had trench warfare. People killed by the thousands and hundreds of thousands. And you had people like General Billy Mitchell who looked upon the airplane as a way that could change warfare and would, could get warfare out of the trenches. Mitchell's determination matched his arrogance. He wanted to consolidate all military air power under one service, an independent air force under his command. Mitchell set out to do something big, something never done before. If the whole world believed that airplanes could not kill ships, well, then he would prove them wrong. In July of 1921, he orchestrated a show for decision makers in Congress. Mitchell's airplanes first destroyed several old battle cruisers. Then came the most important test. Each plane carried a newly invented 2,000-pound bomb. Their target, a captured German battleship, long deemed unsinkable. This was a triumph for Billy Mitchell, and it achieved the exact opposite of what he wanted. It triggered in Navy leadership a decision to look at, hey, we have this air power advocate, General Billy Mitchell, and if we don't embrace aviation and look at aviation as an adjunct to the fleet, then we may have an independent air force on our hands and also may have a Navy that's greatly diminished. Within a few months, the Navy regained the lead, converting a cargo ship into an aircraft carrier christened the Langley. The age of American carrier aviation was born. The Langley operated for two years in an experimental role, testing aircraft and training pilots. We like to talk about the golden age of naval aviation in the 20s, where we had wooden airplanes and iron men. These were people who were willing to literally bet their lives to go ahead and bring this technology and this new kind of warfare to the forefront. It was hard, and it was dangerous, and a lot of naval aviators died. And this is really where the reputation of naval aviation began to be built. The naval aviators of the interwar period are very much characters out of the movies. Yeah, they had silk scarves. Yeah, they had leather jackets and flying helmets. Yeah, they had steely-eyed looks, and they were handsome, and they did daring deeds. They were, for lack of a better term, the macho men of their time, the uh, guys that had uh, no fear. Just as they were confident in their own capabilities, uh, set apart from those that preferred to keep their two feet on the ground. I guess the word is probably ego. Probably ego. It was probably what got me into it. I, man, I want to, you know, I want to be a big shot. 
The image of a naval aviator was a red convertible, top down, with a beautiful blonde alongside. Who could want anything else? Every day you're operating in three dimensions. You don't have time to, to we call it breaking out the book and read and see what the problem is and fix it. You just don't have time to do that. So if you don't have things memorized cold, uh, you can't put them into action quick enough. We make our own mistakes and tell the plane to do the wrong thing sometimes. If things go wrong, they can go really wrong. <laughs> Some days you're you're just on. Some days you're not. Hopefully we'll we'll peak uh, when we head to the boat and and have a good day. We're practiced. We're you know well rested. We're ready to go and we're at the the top part of the game, you know, close to being as as good as we can be. So they're going to move it in uh, 500 pound increments when you give them the signals. So palm up like that and then the palm down, horizontal, is move it down. I'm having a, a feeling that I'm gonna look and be like, wow, I have to land in that little, that little spot, and you know, that boat's not as big as I thought it was gonna be, but trying to keep those out of the head right now and just focus on what, what we were taught to do. This will be a completely new experience for me and most all the other students. We have no fleet experience. It's gonna be loud, it's gonna be busy. I mean, they, they've been showing us all week of people killing themselves behind the boat, you know, crashing left and right. It's all learning points you can take from, and remember, don't do that. I don't want to turn into a fireball. I'd like to land and come home at the end of this. The nerves crank up. It's a, it is uh, completely foreign, and uh, it, it, probably the most exciting thing we've done to, in our lives to this point, so. In the mid-1920s, the Navy had just one small carrier, the Langley. Airplanes had become sturdier, the pilots better trained. But still unresolved was how to use all of this in war. Amid the wavering, one figure emerged to take the lead. His name was Admiral Joseph Mason Reeves. Every move of these naval aircraft has a definite purpose and has the single aim of achieving a fighting fleet. His nickname was Billy Goat Reeves because he had this beard and goatee that he wore. He's a hard charger, a football player at the Naval Academy, studied tactics, and he is a convert to naval aviation. Reeves chafed at naval doctrine that confined planes to reconnaissance. He was after a weapon as lethal as the battleship. For him, it very quickly became, how can we use this aircraft carrier not as a support weapon, but as an offensive weapon, as the offensive centerpiece of, of a naval force? Admiral Reeves understood, even with Langley, that you had to maximize the number of planes that could be launched from that flight deck. Bringing the most intense concentration of firepower onto a target as possible. In 1928, Reeves got a platform that matched his ambitions. The United States takes two incredible hulls of battle cruisers they were building, and they put all of their tonnage into these two ships, and they produce two of the most beautiful, powerful, and in fact, the fastest warships in the world, the Lexington and the Saratoga. Reeves loaded the two carriers with nearly 100 planes each. And within a year, he overcame the seemingly impossible. 
launching and landing dozens of airplanes in rapid fire succession. It's a jigsaw puzzle. It's like baseball, it's a game of inches. You can pick a million different cliches, and, and I don't think any of them really accurately capture what happens on a flight deck with dozens of airplanes, some launching, some recovering. There was this constant ballet going on, choreographed by the deck department, the air department, literally hundreds of young men using their bare hands and muscles to push 90 or 100 airplanes. New and better planes were in the pipeline. The Curtis SBC-4 Helldiver could carry a 1,000-pound bomb almost 600 miles. The next challenge, delivering the bombs with more precision. And for that, they invented dive bombing. Dive bombing is a technique that was developed by the Navy because it provided a very accurate way of bombing a pinpoint target. And ships are pinpoint targets. The planes come in at about 10,000 feet and then pushes over into a steep dive. And when I say steep, meaning going straight down. Inside of the cockpit, they often flew with their canopies open. As the airplane would push over, the visceral feeling of being lifted out of your seat and hanging from your straps, looking through a very simple reflected gun sight. Meanwhile, this ship that you're aiming at, well, it's a moving target. It's snaking, it's circling, it's changing its speed. Then at about 2,800 to about 1,500 feet, which isn't very high at all, you would release the bomb. And then immediately pull in excess of anywhere from four to six or seven Gs uh, to come out of that dive. Naval aviation had gained power reach, numbers, and precision, but was still untested in battle. Starting in 1929, the Navy began a series of war games called Fleet Problems that put Reeves' theories to the test. None proved as prophetic as the vast Pacific exercise known as Fleet Problem 13. On February 7, 1932, the carriers Lexington and Saratoga peeled away from the fleet and sailed towards Hawaii. 152 planes were dispatched to attack Pearl Harbor with dummy bombs. In the mock assault, they pounded the airfields and port facilities. And why it's so important is because it showed that the carrier could operate independently and operate as its own task force and did not need to have the battle line there for support. And it showed the offensive firepower of the aircraft carrier. The Navy minimized the risks of an attack by carriers. For the next decade, the old strategy stayed largely unchanged. These are tough times. This is the Depression. We had existing battleships. They were there. They were paid for. They were, we knew exactly how to employ them and they worked. But Fleet Problem 13 did not go unnoticed. Across the Pacific, the Japanese studied it closely. Over the next decade, they would expand their fleet of large carriers to six. They would build the Zero, a state-of-the-art fighter plane. They would train 3,500 naval pilots. The 
carrier force that moved toward Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 was the largest and most powerful in the world. In a bitter irony, Pearl Harbor would stand as the first real world proof the carrier aviation was the next super weapon. When you walk out on the deck in the mornings, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. It's quiet, it's peaceful. And you start to uh, pre-flight, you can feel the ship starting to wake up. You can hear the surf going underneath the hull. You can look out on the horizon, see the clouds, and you just breathe in that fresh air and you go, it's a good day to fly. out as a division, a flight of four. And everybody that was qualifying was solo, and that's another appeal to, to what we do is that you get to go out there alone, it's on you. Everybody says that your reputation, it doesn't matter how well you fly in the air, your reputation that everybody hears about is how well you land on the carrier. And the, the formation part of the flying was really shaky. I thought we should have looked better coming overhead the ship. Uh, just some, and I think that was more nerves than anything, but the, the three students, we definitely, it was, it was pretty ugly coming overhead. To, to see that piece of American territory out there in the middle of the ocean is awesome. It, it, the first time when you're coming over and, and you look down, it's, you kind of get the chills. I don't know if they were nervous chills or, or just, but wow, it makes you very humble. When you get out to the boat, pretty much just spend 10 minutes giving yourself this like, once in a lifetime pep talk. And next thing you know, towers calling you down to get set up for landing. You have an LSO who's standing next to the wires on the deck on the landing area and he's grading all your passes. They're listening uh, for the sounds the engine's making. They can tell uh, you've made a mistake before you see the mistake. Rolled out, the ball was a little high to begin with, and uh, to keep it safe, bumped up the power a little bit. The landing area is angled to the left of the center line of the ship. So anytime you, you roll up behind the ship, the, the landing area is actually moving away from you, not just away from you, but to the right. So you're always lining up a little right. You'll see the plane kind of undulate. Uh, you'll see black smoke shooting out of the exhaust because you're, you're in there fighting. Saw the LSOs go by and they were all staring straight up at me. Saw the wires go by, it's 30 feet over them. I, I knew mid-pass that it was, that I had just bought that bolter big time, so it, power back up and take back off. A bolter is when they come around with their hook down and they land too long and they miss all the wires. And they have to go around and try it again. The first trap was kind of a, a rough pass for me. Rolled out, center line. I believe it was a good start to a little high in the middle and trying to chip it down, trying to chip it down to a little high at the ramp. The first trap is, there's no way to really describe how it's going to be. It's this screeching noise.
your body gets thrown forward in your seat. When you get that feeling, it's, it's nice because you know you're in fact stopped and on the boat. First attempt at stopping on the boat, made it. <laughs> they taxi me over to get fuel and you know, you're still shaking, your foot's sitting there pulsing. And you know, they taxi you up to the cat, shoot me off. Everything goes dead silent. My first initial thought was that my engine just failed. I had to realize that I was still climbing and my airspeed was increasing to realize that I'm, I'm safely airborne. Coming down a high start and trying to chip it down while remembering the first pass, which was my fly through down for the one wire. Didn't want to do that. Kept too much power on it. And I forgot to put my hook down. Around I went, so. Second day, the fangs came out a little bit more. I guess the cockiness came out, maybe. Jordan Meredith, one of my good buddies, he had a better second day, but it ended up being, uh, I edged him out just by a little bit. With, with Rob being in the Navy, me being in the Marine Corps, Rob's chances of going back to the boat are almost guaranteed. I mean, that's all the Navy jet pilots go to the boat, whereas Marine jet pilots don't necessarily go to the boat ever again. So we've pretty much been flying together. We've gone out to El Centro to do bombing together, and obviously we went to the carrier together. So it'll be uh, tough. He's a Marine, which means that the odds are I probably won't see him again in my career. I was kind of depressed because the fact that Marines don't always get to go to the boat uh, and the fact that I may never go to the boat again, it's such a cool experience that you don't want it to end, and when it does, it's kind of kind of rough. Devastation at Pearl Harbor was the work of carriers. 350 Japanese planes launched from hundreds of miles out at sea. In just two hours, they wiped out most of the battleships of the Pacific Fleet. It was a master stroke. Japan had not been stopped, and there were some people in the United States who believed Japan couldn't be stopped that eventually Japan would not only control all of China, the Philippines, and Dutch East Indies, but the northern coast of Australia, possibly even India. In the United States, the loss of the battleships upended every plan for how a war in the Pacific could be fought and won. By sheer luck, three aircraft carriers had been spared. They were out at sea during the attack. You have this bizarre situation that the Japanese attack with aircraft carriers forces the United States into a carrier-based naval strategy. It was now up to the US carriers to hold the line against Japan's Imperial Navy. In June of 1942, the Japanese fleet moved toward a pair of small American-held islands in the Pacific. Midway Atoll was just a 1,000 miles west of Hawaii and strategically important. A threat of invasion was sure to draw a full-out American response. It was designed as a perfect trap. The American sortie with about 50 ships. Three of them are aircraft carriers. 
They're facing off against what look to be impossible odds. The enemy has vast, vast numbers of ships, almost 200 ships. They've sorted the entire combined fleet. The morning of June 4th did not start well for the Americans. Radar on Midway began tracking 107 incoming Japanese planes. Within minutes, every operational U.S. plane was in the air. The Japanese bombers swept through the defenses. Out at sea, the U.S. carriers Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown launched their planes, hoping to hit the Japanese carriers before they could unleash a second strike. Three squadrons of TBD Devastator torpedo planes reached the Japanese fleet. Flying at wave top level, they were easy prey for anti-aircraft fire. Of 41 torpedo planes, only four survived. Not one torpedo scored. The early strikes that morning, both from Midway and from the American carriers, suffer crippling losses. The casualties were just insane. Of the men and aircraft that launched that morning, about half did not return. Meanwhile, two squadrons of SBD Dauntless dive bombers launched from the Enterprise in search of the Japanese carriers. They were led by a 40-year-old lieutenant commander from Buffalo, New York, named Wade McCluskey. McCluskey gets out to the point where he's been told the Japanese fleet will be waiting for you there. Gets out there, butt kiss. Nothing in sight. Staring at the vast expanse of ocean, McCluskey had to decide whether to return his men to the Enterprise or lead them on a fool's errand. And McCluskey decides, well, I'm going to take my force of two squadrons of dive bombers, and I'm going to have them follow me on a very methodical search pattern. Now, he has a little problem. He's running low on gas. And more than a few of his pilots are looking at their gas gauges, wondering if the old man really knows what he's doing. And then McCluskey spots a Japanese destroyer. He figures, that Japanese destroyer is going at high speed towards something. I'll bet you that's the Japanese fleet. McCluskey followed the destroyer. Approaching from the south, he spotted three Japanese carriers. His bombers plunged into their dives, catching two of the carriers by complete surprise. Minutes later, a third U.S. squadron stumbled on the scene and attacked. As McCluskey looked behind, through the tall columns of smoke, he was stunned. The Americans had sunk three carriers, along with some 300 aircraft, and nearly 4,000 men. That man 
And that action took the Japanese Navy essentially out of the war at that moment. The Japanese have gone from an absolute position of supremacy to they never go on the offensive ever again. And it all came down to about three, oh, four dozen dive bombers. The pilots who followed McCluskey that day were ordinary men. Many were newly enlisted. They had no right to win, but they did. And in doing so, they changed the course of a war. The Battle of Midway was the most decisive single naval battle in US history. Over the course of World War II, Navy airplanes would provide the dominant firepower in every important battle in the Pacific. Carrier aviation had proved itself beyond measure. watched every World War movie I could get my hands on as a little kid. Yeah. <laughs> Attack on Pearl Harbor, Battle of Midway. The history has shown that even small carrier forces can bring a lot to bear the way things are. One person can change history, basically. So it's a, it's a very large responsibility. What you got there? I said wings. It's a nice finish to a, you know, a lot of hard work. So, yeah, it's definitely, definitely a good time. I let them bask in the glory of it for a day, and I was like, guess what? The next challenge is ahead of you. <laughs> 